All right, well, thank you all. Um, this panel's purpose is to bring regulators and former regulators, privacy professionals, technologists, and sociologists together to, do, to reflect on exactly how legal frameworks, professional norms, standards organizations can start addressing the values and governance that we need to bring to bear on privacy issues. And I'd like to start by introducing our panelists, many of whom are familiar to all of you. Uh, Julie Brill, my former colleague at the Federal Trade Commission, has been a commissioner at the FTC now for the last four years. Soon to be four Soon years. Soon to be four yeah. years. Wow. Sitting to her right is Cam Carey, former Department of Commerce General Counsel, uh, now with the MIT Media Labs and the Brookings Institution. Cam is one of the lead authors of the White House Privacy Bill of Rights, uh, for which we are all grateful. To, uh, to Cam's right is Erica Rothenberg. Erica is the general counsel of LinkedIn, and she informs me that as of this moment, they have 277 million users, but that number has already changed um, <laughs> because it's ever increasing. Uh, to Julie's right is Rainier Steinso. We are very happy to have Rainier here. He's the head of the Data Protection Reform Unit in the German Ministry of the Interior. Uh, Rainier's come the longest distance in order to attend this. Uh, to Rainier's left is Cynthia Dwork. Cynthia is a distinguished scientist at Microsoft Research, and she's known for doing analytic work in privacy preserving data uh, uh, analytics. And to her left, uh, last but not least, uh, if, if for no other reason he has the longest title, is Mitchell Stevens, who is professor of education at Stanford and is also the director of digital research and planning for the Graduate School of Education. So Mitchell is an expert, on, among other things, on online education. So I want to start this panel off by talking about sort of existing legal frameworks. And I thought it would be most appropriate to ask Cam this question, because after all, our purpose today is to enable John and Nicole to write the report they need to report in, next, in the next 17 days. And I thought we'd give them some practical, some practical ideas. So Cam, what is your view about whether and when the administration will introduce new legislation based on the mm -hmm. Consumer Bill of Rights, which you had your hand in writing. And even if it does, my second tier question is this. We all know how gridlock Congress is. What can the president, what can the Obama administration do on its own without mm -hmm. further legislation to enhance the privacy values that we've been talking about today? All right, well, thanks, Dave. It's funny, I do, I do have an opinion on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm stunned. <laughs> Surprising. Um, <laughs> uh, I certainly hope uh, that, that there is the opportunity now to move forward uh, uh, to try to put the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights uh, into legislation. Um, that's something that we were working on at the Commerce Department uh, uh, before I left. I think I had arrived uh, at a point where I thought the it was time for the administration to, to put a proposal forward, but you know, really with uh, uh, the Snowden disclosures, uh, that discussion has, uh, has not been possible. But you know, now, now I think it is. Um, and you know, we've heard a lot in the course of uh, today's discussion about uh, you know, enhanced transparency, not just uh, privacy policies, but you know, ongoing dynamic uh, transparency. We've heard uh, uh, about uh, con consent, uh, both you know, being adequate but being uh, inadequate, but being needing to be more robust uh, in some situations. Um, about uh, different kinds of uh, use limitations. Uh, and I think the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights really anticipates a lot of those issues, it anticipates a lot of the issues of big data by sort of moving away from uh, a pure notice and choice framework to something that is more dynamic, uh, more holistic. And I think that's really what we've heard over the course of, of this discussion. Uh, I think you know, clearly uh, this is a challenging uh, legislative uh, environment. So um, 
Uh, and you know, one of the actually one of the risks of putting forward a proposal is that some people will oppose it simply because the Obama administration uh, is for it. But I think there's a lot to be gained in this discussion uh, by putting a proposal out there. We've had uh, uh, in the course of today's workshop this series of workshops what the president called for last summer, a national conversation about privacy, about uh, data collection. Um, and putting a uh, proposal forward would continue uh, that discussion um, and I think give, give sort of more of an impetus uh, to the multi-stakeholder processes that NTIA is continuing to, to, to do. So I think there's a lot of value in having that out there, putting out a clear, uh, a clear model uh, of you know, how, uh, how that would work and uh, you know, having you know, uh, baseline principles, uh, but really you know, leaving uh, the, the details to conversations like this one. And we've seen over the course of uh, the last couple of days, over the last several weeks, how complicated these issues are. So what a uh, you know, seamless web it is. So you really need uh, for the details to have uh, that sort of robust uh, multi-stakeholder process. You can't just do it with the government uh, uh, charting the way. Uh, but I also think you know, we need to do it uh, uh, because it is the right thing to do. Uh, uh, you know, in uh, uh, the current environment, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, a marketplace that is just not functioning. I, mean, I believe in in the marketplace, but I think in, uh, in the data world uh, because of uh, a real disparity uh, of information uh, between those who collect the data and those who supply it, uh, that you know, we don't, we have a very asymmetrical marketplace. Uh, we have, as some people have talked about uh, here today, a, a marketplace in which uh, consumers uh, don't enjoy uh, a lot of the benefit to, uh, of the data that they generate. It's not to say that there aren't benefits uh, that, that they receive, but you know, there's, um, I think, a disproportion there. So we need to empower uh, consumers. I think, you know, the Bill of Rights, uh, uh, my colleague at MIT, Sandy Pentland's uh, uh, New Deal on data are all about fundamentally giving consumers more power. And that will drive the marketplace uh, to do more things uh, uh, to you know, allow uh, consumers to benefit, like uh, I applaud what Automatic is doing. I applaud the human-centered uh, 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 work that, that Palantir uh, is doing. Um, now we need to generate more of that in the marketplace. We, if you know, technology, I believe, can solve a lot of these problems, we need to create a market for that technology. Um, and finally, I think you know, the United States needs to lead in this area. Um, you know, we, uh, we have a very strong privacy protective system. Uh, you know, Deirdre Mulligan and, and Ken Brandberger have done uh, a great job of documenting the strengths of, of our system. Um, and President Obama has done a lot, I think, to, uh, in the steps that he's taken uh, uh, with respect to surveillance, uh, uh, you know, ex uh, extending protections to uh, non-U.S. citizens, uh, the steps he's taking on the two, 215 program, uh, to really demonstrate that you know, U.S. privacy values are strong. I think those protections uh, uh, stand up to any country in the world. Uh, I think to move forward on the, uh, on the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights, uh, would underscore uh, you know, the strength uh, of our privacy convictions, the strength of uh, the president's convictions, the strength of uh, you know, United States privacy values. So Julie, you don't work for President Obama. No. You are a government official who is a commissioner on an independent agency. What is the FTC going to be doing for the next foreseeable period of time? on privacy issues these days, and how does this fit in with the administration's push on privacy? Well, we have a very, very robust enforcement program dealing with privacy, and we also have a very robust um, program that uh, focuses on helping businesses and consumers 
uh, figure out um, how to navigate the space that they're in. With respect to businesses, we talk a lot about best practices, and uh, we will continue to work in that area. We do workshops, we prepare reports. In 2012, we came out with a report uh, that uh, we had some workshops that led up to it, where we really started to rethink how privacy ought to be um, thought of in the United States. And we looked at problems around notice and choice, some of which we talked about earlier today. We looked at issues around transparency, around de-identification. It was really an important document, I think, that began a lot of the conversations and, and frankly fed into much of what um, uh, the President's uh, Privacy Bill of Rights uh, reflected mm -hmm. in terms of context of the transaction and things like that. Um, we've also done workshops around how to just how should businesses do notices when they're dealing with when they're on smartphones when the, when they're they're providing an app or some other service that's uh, got very little real estate to communicate with consumers. How do they effectively communicate um, ideas around collection and use of information? and still provide those important privacy policies at the end of the day. So we talked about things like just-in-time notice and, and whatnot. So we do a lot around best practices, which I think are really important, but they're not enforcement mechanisms. So in addition to the best practices that we developed, the workshops that we have, we had one on alternative scoring a couple of weeks ago. Um, we're about to have one on user-generated health information, another very important area that we've touched on here, um, information that may fall outside of HIPAA. Um, we also have a very robust enforcement regime. And uh, the two prongs, uh, or the two areas of jurisdiction that we have, is one is deception. That is, is a company engaged in deceptive practices? And then the other is, are their practices unfair? And we've spent a lot of time talking about fairness and unfairness today. But before we get to that, let me just talk about deception for a second. And particularly its limitations, I believe, in the big data context. Deception is a great tool. We use it all the time. We use it with respect to practices that uh, involve not just monetary harm, but also may involve invasion of personal space, uh, collecting too much information, things like that. But deception in and of itself is considered harmful. We don't have an additional harm test when we're using deception. The, the, the deception, if, if a company says they're going to do one thing and they do something else and it's a material statement, it's considered to be harmful. So we don't have to have an additional harm test. Um, it works really well, I believe, when the company has a first-person relationship with a consumer. That is, they're telling consumers what it is they're going to do, and they either live up to that or they don't. In a big data world, whether we're talking about data brokers or we're talking about anal an anal analytics that's happening behind the scenes, it's a little bit harder to have a state. You can have a statement about what you're going to do. You could live up to best practices. You could live up to a code of conduct and all those kinds of things. But in terms of a statement that's going to the consumer, it doesn't really happen because you're not interfacing with the consumer. So there's some limitations on our use of deception. It's not impossible if there's a code of conduct or something like that, but there are limitations. So I think unfairness is really going to, um, to a certain extent, be an area that I think may provide the most fruitful area for enforcement in a big data context. Our unfairness test is interesting. And how it will evolve in a big data context, I think, will be interesting to watch. Um, someone earlier, it may have been Ken Bamberger, it may have been someone else, said that typically the uh, FTC focuses on financial harm. And that isn't entirely true. And I think if you do look at our cases over time, beginning with Eli Lilly, uh, the Eli Lilly case, the Sears case, other cases, these were not cases about financial harm. These were cases about um, using to, uh, more, much more information than was necessary uh, for uh, invading uh, personal space, as in the Aaron's designer wear case, where there was rent-to-own computers that actually were turning the camera around and allowing the uh, rent-to-own company to spy in, into consumers' homes. These were some of our unfairness cases, and they're very important cases, I think, to talk about the limitations, the contours around which companies uh, can um, uh, act. But what's interesting about it is it has a balancing test. Our unfairness jurisdiction says that um, the action must uh, cause or be likely to cause substantial injury to the consumer, and that injury is not supposed to be speculative or emotional, just so everybody knows whatever that means. Um, it can't be emotional. It can't be emotional. Yeah, right. it, also, it also requires that the injury is not reasonably avoidable by consumers, and the injury cannot be outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers or competition. 
Now, in many of the cases we've done, we haven't really had to focus that much on whether consumers could um, uh, avoid the harm because it was clear that they couldn't. We didn't have to deal too much on that balancing test uh, part of, the, um, of, of unfairness. But I think is, is if we were to start to apply this test in a world of big data, I think the balancing test will become much more important. Because as we've been talking about all day, there are some benefits to big data, collection and use. And so how we do that balance, I think, will be very important. One thing I'm going to want to watch going forward is that, is that we not have asymmetrical evidentiary requirements. In other words, the harm should be have the same amount of evidence as the benefits. The benefits shouldn't be speculative. They shouldn't be emotional. They should be real, <laughs> right? So, and, and frankly, but it works both ways, right? I mean, we've already got it clear that, if, that for the harm, it works that way. Let's make sure the benefits are working that way, too. And this leads me to talk about, and, and as many of you know that I, I speak a lot about safe harbor. I speak a lot about the European um, approach to data protection and what's happening with the proposed reg, some of the provisions of which I think will um, be very helpful to consumers and some to, to businesses. But what's really interesting is that the European approach also has a balancing test. When you look at what is a legitimate interest right, of, of, of data and, and data use, it's a balancing test, looking at that legitimate interest versus other interests. So I think that this balance, this act of balancing benefits and harms is going to be much more important to regulators, certainly to the FTC going forward. And I expect if the, well, actually in the current regime and also if the proposed reg goes forward, it will be much more important to Europeans as well. That's the perfect segue to my question to Erica. Erica, you represent sort of a big data company. You've got now 278 million users. <laughs> um, Actually, many more. That figure was from Q4. But. And you have the year of all of these regulators. So what would the two or three points that you'd want to get across to the regulators who are formulating new norms and, in Julie's case, formulating enforcement priorities? Yeah. Um. So three points. I have many more, but I'll well, stick to yeah, three. We're yeah, keep you to three. <laughs> <laughs> so no. So I actually, um, and Julie, you've heard me say this before, but for the benefit of everyone, I actually think our interests are aligned. We are not interested in losing the trust of our members, right? I, I mean, we're successful um, because our members entrust us with their data, and our members entrust us to do the right things. Um, it takes a long time to build that trust, and it's a snap of the fingers to breach it. And so I actually fundamentally believe that regulators and companies like ours are actually looking at it from the same side. And it's how is it that we best protect um, our members and our consumers? Because it doesn't do anyone any good um, to lose that trust or to have data breaches or to have surprises. And so it really is um, come to companies and work with companies and while you can't you know, just turn a blind eye, you can verify and trust, or trust and verify. And you can, um, I, I think, come thinking that, hey, we are looking to do the right thing. And we're not looking to surprise our members. And so um, working in that fashion, and I'll, like, big kudos to, to you and the fellow commissioners and David when you were there. Um, like, I've seen a big change um, in the FTC over my nearly six years at LinkedIn in terms of working collaboratively and consultatively, um, in terms of how we treat member, what we collect and how we treat member data. And I think that that does a world of good in terms of advancing consumer protection. Um, the EU does that as well, and the Canadians do that too. I mean, I have um, significant experience with um, all three of those sets of regulators. Um, Number two is that I think that a one-size-fits-all uh, legislation will fail. It just can't work. Um, I do believe that the FTC, as you said, there's robust enforcement. I do believe that you have the appropriate tools to go after the bad guys, um, and it's important to go after the bad guys. I think it's also really, really important as we think about uh, data privacy regulation that we don't do anything to stifle innovation and creativity. When you look at um, America's economic bright spot over the last decade, it really has been from technology. And it's been because we don't have legislation that stifles that innovation. Um, and we've driven, you know, this industry has driven our economy, and I think that that's important um, to maintain and not to stifle. Um, 
So I, I will leave it at. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and I'm going to come back to the trust issue in a bit if we have time. Cynthia, so you're the you're the actual technocrat here. You actually know sort of the math of privacy. So the question I have for you is. What's the most important insight that you've drawn from your work that you would want the regulators to really understand? The most important insight is that you can't look at a particular system for protecting privacy in isolation. That things interact badly or they, they risk interacting badly. You could have 2K anonymous releases of data sets that taken in their entirety give you only one anonymity, no K anonymity anymore. Um, uh, the other version of this question is, what's the danger in learning that I, what's the harm in learning that I buy bread? There is absolutely no harm as far as I can tell in learning that I buy bread. There is no harm as far as I can tell in learning that I don't buy bread. But if you notice a change, a pattern over years of buying bread and then suddenly I don't buy bread anymore, then you think, ah, maybe diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. If I like scented hand lotion and then suddenly stop liking scented hand lotion, perhaps at Target you would say pregnant. So what's going on here is a failure of privacy mechanisms which said, oh, this is safe and oh, that is safe. <coughs> They're not composing properly. They're having very bad effects when you mix them. That's the most important thing that I could say. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to Rainier next. You have spent a lot of time in sort of understanding how the EU privacy system works. You're highly familiar with the US system. You too have the ear of the, e, of the US regulators. What's the piece of advice that you think that based on your experience in the EU, we should try to emulate here in the United States? Uh, our experience after two years of negotiations of the regulation is that um, uh, you're trying to make our Congress look uh, good. Well, um, <laughs> yes, that, that, well, maybe that's one one point. Uh, what, I, I will come back to it. What, what are the goals we like to achieve in, in in Europe? The one is harmonization because we think it's better to have one uh, common uh, data protection law even for the private sector. That's very important uh, for U.S. companies on the, on the European market, but also for our big companies on the European market to have just one data protection regime in charge. Um, the problem we have with the goal of harmonization is that this is a problem in the public sector because in the public sector, uh, we don't see the same need for further harmonization because we have many, many legislation on the national level which we'd like to keep. Um, but this is one of the main goals and I think it's, it's also a common goal we have uh, with uh, international partners. Uh, we, we need a kind of a harmonization in terms of common standards. Um, with the, the US uh, in the private sector, but also with other areas uh, around the globe. And therefore, I think the, the initiative of the White House uh, two years ago already now uh, was a very good one because uh, it was a, a strategy, um, an offer, I would say also, to others, to partners, to figure out what these common standards could be uh, in the future. Uh, so um, this uh, is something we still have to work on uh, that uh, we, if we define our harmonized standards that we build also bridges to other partners and to find ways for more interoperability. So the second goal of our um, uh, regulation of our um, reform of the data protection law is that we thought our existing law is now 20 years old and it's uh, too old-fashioned uh, for new technologies like big data and other things we discussed today. And uh, this is the tricky thing because um, what we have on the table now, what was proposed, is more or less the existing system. Uh, it's the system of the 95 directive. It's more or less our old-fashioned law, uh, which is good uh, in some fields um, because it it, it worked well and, uh, and we have some experience with it. But in other areas we see um, we, we, we have more and more problems to apply this. Um, examples that were discussed, target and pregnancy, for example. Uh, I'm not really sure whether our uh, law will give any answer on this problem. 
uh, also the proposals we have now. I don't uh, think and the proposals we covered either. <clears throat> yeah, and so what we are looking for is what, what are the elements we, we should uh, add in our regulation uh, to have a more modernized version of data protection and privacy. And that brings us directly to what we discussed here too. Um, what is the whole thing about? Uh, so we don't call it privacy in Europe, we call it uh, data protection now. But it's not to protect the data. The data is not the value itself. Uh, <laughs> it, it is something behind it. Uh, and uh, what is the danger and what is the harm and what is the risk? And uh, I think uh, we should spend more time to define this. Um, the council where I'm working in uh, with the de German delegation um, introduced uh, a risk-based approach uh, to avoid this one-size-fits-all model. Um, what we haven't done yet is to find the right criteria for uh, defining risks or non-risks. Um, but I think there are some elements uh, also in these discussions today and, and, and yesterday uh, which are pretty common uh, to the things we, we, we think about in, in, in Europe. One criteria might be discrimination. Uh, financial discrimination, but also other discrimination uh, by using new technologies or decisions, uh, automated decisions, which, which discriminate well, come people. Back to that the minute. second one uh, could be um, something like the context, uh, which is in the, in the Bill of Rights too, uh, that uh, we should maybe find as a criteria that you might have a reasonable expectation <laughs> that in some areas, environments, you are not spied by your own television, for example, or uh, that, that data is not collected in some context. And if so, that data is safe in this context and uh, is not transmitted or um, uh, that, that is no uh, uh, unallowed access to uh, these data. And there might be other elements, like also uh, what, what dignity or, or honor, something like that, or um, the private sphere. Uh, and I think it, it would be a good idea to think about this, um, uh, these criteria for risks as a legislator. And, and, and I think there we have a, maybe it's a once in a lifetime chance that we could figure out the same elements here uh, in Europe and in other parts of the, the, the world. It's no coincidence and that then, both the EU and the United States started their privacy rethinks at the same time. Yeah, I think yeah, both systems yeah. were worried that we just weren't capable of reacting to rapidly changing technology. So you have one yeah. more minute, and then, yeah. and then I have to move on. Um, yeah, I mean, th th this, is, this is our, uh, our challenge at the moment. And um, I, I think it, it's not that many we can say about w what is our experience and what could the US learn from Europe, because we are in the middle of the process. Uh, and the same vice versa. Uh, and th that's uh, why it makes sense to uh, get in contact uh, and to think about these things. And also, I mean, we, we should think about uh, new elements and the German government is very engaged in uh, making proposals to um, find more ways of interoperability. Maybe also on a level of what was also in the um, Bill of uh, Rights on the White House paper, um, uh, codes of conduct uh, based on multi-stakeholder processes. So what we introduced uh, for the regulation was something which might be a little bit too formal for uh, the US side, but it, it should work and might work on the European side. And if you have another system on the US side and they come together and build some kind of codes of conduct for more detailed routes, I think this would, uh, would, would be a good uh, uh, perspective. Okay, so Mitchell, so far we've been talking about law. You teach students what I understand to be data science of education. Not me, some of my best friends. Some of your best friends do. <laughs> so I think it would be helpful to us when we talked about this, you talked about how you teach, how students are taught the norms of legal and ethics when it comes to data science. And tell us a little about how you try to train future data scientists and future educators because part of the conversation today is the public knows very little about what happens behind the screen. This whole ecosystem of tracking and analytics is a mystery to most consumers. So how, how do you deal with students about that and what are the ethical considerations that go into your program? And I'm really pleased I got, I got to follow Zach, um, his comments this morning, I, they were very much in line with, with my own thinking. 
Uh, uh, someone said during the break that we haven't been optimistic enough in this uh, convening about the promise of, of big data. Uh, there's no question that uh, the educational sciences are undergoing a, a revolution. Uh, uh, our operating presumption at Stanford and elsewhere is that that data revolution is going to be positive for the sciences of teaching and learning. Uh, we don't have a, an accumulated body of empirical knowledge yet because we're very early in this process, but our, our presumption is that by virtue of our capacity to, 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 to watch individuals move through uh, an instructional trajectory with a degree of variety and fidelity that's never been possible before, we can set aside uh, the, the presumptions that inferential statistics obliged us to, to make um, in the 20th century when we were uh, essentially, as Zach said, testing uh, learners at time one, uh, applying a treatment, measure, testing them again at time two, and then inferring some sort of learning process on the basis of, of, of very distant uh, uh, traces of, of, of what was happening in between. Uh, we don't have to do that anymore. Uh, and uh, the, the possibility of doing for teaching and learning uh, what entities like Google did for search uh, in the last decade is a thrilling uh, opportunity for, for educators. And in fact, education research has all new, whole new colleagues in the information and engineering sciences that we, that, uh, we didn't really have before. Uh, the big question for us uh, at Stanford is, whose knowledge will that be? Uh, uh, when a student enrolls in a course, uh, a Stanford-branded course on Coursera, she creates a data stream that is simultaneously the property of Coursera and of Stanford University. Uh, if that student at some future point in some world that we have yet to build at Stanford, uh, uh, it moves through that instructional experience for a, for a credit-bearing uh, credential, then those data will also uh, uh, be implicated in federal governance in ways that they aren't be, uh, at present. So uh, we think very seriously, actually we have to think very seriously because our general counsel, um, uh, uh, which helped us negotiate three contracts with one of these providers, for example, uh, at all the time, whose data are those? Uh, and uh, by implication, whose knowledge will that be? Uh, in the 20th century, uh, education research, like educational delivery itself, was presumed to be, if not a project of government, uh, 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 funded primarily by government. In the United States, we often proudly let, pro uh, sometimes proprietary, often not-for-profit third parties, convey education uh, on behalf of government. But Always implicitly and very often explicitly, uh, education itself was presumed to be a project of government, and it was implicated in the production of a virtuous citizenry. Uh, and by extension, educational data production was presumed to be a project of government for the purpose of improving teaching and learning on behalf of states. Well, now we're at a moment where arguably some of the, the richest uh, data streams on teaching and learning are being produced by proprietary entities almost entirely outside the purview of government. Uh, and so this, uh, for educators, not just for researchers, for educators it raises whole new questions of, of, of uh, who kind of owns or who has uh, some sort of proprietary claim on the project of education uh, uh, which since the earliest inception of modernity has been presumed to be a project of sovereigns. And so um, it's, a, it's a humbling problem and a very large one. Uh, one reason I'm not very optimistic about the conversation that I get to be having a com uh, engaged in now is that asking questions about whose data these are I think is a very good prolegomena for these much larger questions about whose institutions these are. Um, I think there's little well, doubt. The question of yeah. whose data it is runs across many fields. Yeah. So medical devices now communicate information back to the manufacturers. If you have a defibrillator in your chest, it's, mm -hmm. is it your data? Is it your doctor's data? Is it the proprietary data of the company? Let me just quickly switch gears, and this is the lightning round, okay? We don't have much time, and there's six of you. So I want, I want to switch gears and talk a little about 
the algorithmic discussion that Omar led just a few minutes ago. Say because that once more. The, the use of algorithms. What, what some people call the tyranny of algorithms or data determinism. And so algorithms are here to stay. Decisions made by machines using algorithms are here to stay. Like it or not, they're embedded in the way businesses work. There's an argument, of course, that machines are not a bad substitute for human beings. Machines are biased, so can human beings. Uh, human, humans can have incomplete information, as can machines. But algorithms are going to be used. And so the question that has been posed in many of the panels up to, up to now is, what should the regulatory choice be in terms of overseeing the use of these algorithms? And there have been a number discussed. Transparency, oversight, remediation. One that hasn't been mentioned, but I care deeply about, is validation, reliability. And so I want each of you to give me your one piece of advice to John and Nicole about what kind of oversight we need to start thinking about in terms of using a tool that is here to stay uh, and is now rather ubiquitous in industry. So I think I'm going to start this question out with Erica because she probably has thought about this more than anyone else. Um, I think the ability to correct, right? So the transparency and ability to correct, it doesn't mean that you show the algorithm because that's proprietary. And I think that we need to protect that proprietary nature, again, to fuel innovation and to incentivize innovation. Um, and I also think that we need to think about the harm and that there are existing frameworks that exist th that are in existence today that can address harm from certain decisions. So whether it's the FCRA because a decision is going to be made about someone's credit reporting or whether it's an employment decision that's going to be made based on uh, you know, an algorithm that says, okay, this is an African-American you know, female. Um, or someone who, uh, yeah, sexual orientation. And so again, I think if we look at the harm and go to existing frameworks that exist currently today, I, I, I think between the two, transparency, the ability to correct, and existing frameworks, we're okay. Cam. So I fundamentally agree with uh, Erica on that. I, I think the problem with algorithms is that they are predictions, they are models. Uh, that's a tool that's not always right. So you know, an 80% probability that I fit within some classification may be fine to serve me up an ad, but to make a decision on my credit worthiness or some other sensitive decision, uh, it's not. Uh, so I think a lot depends on, uh, on context. Uh, I think that transparency uh, is probably the best tool to get at, at that. I don't think the government can be well, the police of algorithms. When you say transparency, Cam, there's all sorts of different mm -hmm. kinds of transparency. I want to pin you down on okay. what you mean. Um, I think it is the sort of transparency that, for example, we're seeing the, the transparency uh, disclosures that online companies are making about uh, responses to surveillance. You get some aggregate numbers about uh, the effects of the algorithm, so you don't, you know, you don't get to look at the, the source code. If you want to do open code, fine, but um, I think that's uh, that's a bridge too far. But I think there's there's information uh, that companies can put out that would give people a sense of what is the effect of their use of the algorithm. Julie, I know you've thought a lot about this. Yeah, I think a lot about it, and I, I don't think there's going to be a silver bullet answer. I don't think there's one answer to this. So I think all the, um, the, the, the policy uh, points that you made need to be part of the solution. I, I like to think of, the, of building a tapestry. Um, we're going to weave a tapestry, and it's the tapestry that's going to really uh, produce the, the result. The we, I hope, is not Congress. Uh, no, I, I actually, so I'm, I'm actually a big believer um, in instilling market forces and putting market forces in place. I think one of the big problems with a lot of the entities that are engaged in algorithmic projects, um, whether they're data brokers or other types of analysts, is there's no market force in play. Erica's absolutely right. The consumer-facing companies like LinkedIn and others have huge trust issues that, uh, you know, that they, they, they need to keep their consumers trust. They are deeply concerned about that. They goof up, everybody goofs up, and that's when we sometimes step in. But they have huge market forces in place to keep them on track. The non-consumer facing companies do not. And that's why I think transparency issues, 
and I'll be specific about what kind I think need to be put in place, will really help the non-consumer facing companies have those same forces in place so that they too have to start thinking about trust. I like to quote Louis Brandeis, the father of the FTC. The FTC is now about to turn 100 years old. I guess we are this year 100 years old. And yeah, pretty old. And um, <laughs> we don't have too many well, we wrinkles. Don't look we, we, don't, we don't have too many wrinkles. <laughs> we use all the creams that we then go after. Um, uh, <laughs> But he, what he said was, you know, sunlight is, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And that's what market forces bring, is sunlight. So what do I mean? I actually do not, I, it would be interesting if algorithms were actually disclosed. I'm not that, because I'm thinking about the consumer. The consumers don't need algorithms. I think there are a lot of researchers who would love to see the algorithms, and that would be really interesting. But what I think a consumer needs to know is, what is the effect that the algorithm has on them? So. Uh, like like um, Axiom has done with aboutthedata.com is they have put some information up on a web portal so consumers can see what some information about them that, that Axiom has and how they're profiled, what, it, what bucket they're placed into as a result of that information. One of the deficiencies, and I've spent a lot of time talking to Axiom about this, I think it's a good first step. One of the deficiencies is there's no explanation of what that bucket means. So if your bucket is second city struggler, you know, it's, it could be code for, the, there are lots of very interesting buckets out there. Axiom actually recently changed their um, uh, consumer segments. They're called segments. Um, but there are other companies that have not. And some of them are may, may appear to be code for something else, which is deeply troubling. So there might not be enough information going to consumers about what those segments mean. I think more of that is needed. You know what I think about a lot in terms of transparency are the credit reporting agencies or, or other companies that are disclosing to consumers their credit score. And they now have tools that say, if you take out this loan, watch what will happen to your score. Or if you fail to pay back this loan, watch what happens to your score. From a consumer-oriented perspective, that effect to me is the most important thing. Scientists and, 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 and researchers like Cynthia might love to get into the algorithm, but what consumers need to know is what's the effect. That's right. Rainier, you're up. Well, yeah, that's a very, uh, difficult question. Um, we uh, have discussed the problem. No, we need of, uh, one. <laughs> yeah, the, the the question of algorithm uh, in in Europe. Uh, we talk about uh, a paragraph, a rule, an article about profiling. I'm not really sure whether this, this is the same or not. Um, but I'd like to give you a, a personal answer on on the algorithm problem. Um, after these discussions yesterday and uh, and today, and uh, I wonder whether the little NSA is still here in the room, but um, the, the question he's was... He's always here. His, no, he his, was uh, over there. I think he's, I think he's uh, gone. He can find us. <laughs> what, we can identify him, and, and that's exactly the point. Um, I, I think maybe if you think about algorithms and big data, there might be a common benefit, a common use. We don't necessarily need to identify a person. Maybe you can. You have the tools to do so. But you don't in general, because uh, you are only interested in patterns, whatever, for scientists uh, or, or, or whatever. But then the next step, when it comes to the identification of a person, uh, then it's getting tricky. And this is maybe the, the, the point where regulation should have a focus on uh, if it's getting dangerous for the person. Uh, dangerous uh, in terms of what I said about the risk-based uh, uh, approach or, or, or the risky model. If um, for example, uh, the big data analytics and the algorithms, they tell you in the end uh, even more about yourself than you even, don't, uh, that you even know before. Uh, this was the question we were asked yesterday in, in our workshops. And um, if so, if uh, because of the algorithms and the big data, someone knows that, well, you have some kind of difficult disease or you, are, uh, you might have a risk of cancer or something like that, um, what happens then? Should we inform this person? Should we identify it or not? I think Germany has just come out and in favor of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. what you're really describing is the yeah. FCRA model for making personalized decisions with big yeah. data. Yeah. And, and the question is whether the regulator should then decide whether this information should be provided to this individual or not. And yesterday, my answer was not. I, I think it's too difficult to give a general answer on it. 
because uh, it depends on how important the information is, it depends how accurate it is, it depends on many, many factors. And then I think these decisions can only be taken by a, a single person and within its responsibility, uh, not uh, for uh, <coughs> lawmakers. But, I mean, I don't know if I have answered the question, but this is my, these are my All thoughts. Right. Well, well Cynthia will argument. answer the question for yeah. us. I'm completely confused. <laughs> um, I have a quick question for Erica, though. When you said the ability to correct, did you mean the ability to correct the inputs to the algorithm or to change the outcome? Uh, ability to correct the inputs. And again, I think it depends upon what the situation we want to get what Omer the situation is. Is. The key here okay, is good. to get Omer back on Citicorp okay. so he right. can get his money. So, um, <laughs> so I have a couple of things to say. First of all, I think what people really are interested in, in addition to being sure that the inputs are correct, is I got an outcome that I don't like. What is a reasonable path that I might follow to change the That's outcome? Right. What right. could I do to get to the outcome that I want? And I think that the whoever is, or whatever is making the decision, it would be great if that information could be given. Here are a few things you could do that would radically change your credit score, would change whether or not you could be approved for the loan. Algorithmically, I don't know how to answer that. I have some algorithm, it's a machine learning algorithm, it, it, you know, it gets inputs, it produces outputs, but it's a very interesting scientific question, how can we actually try to come up with methods for, given these algorithms, find short paths to changing the outcome. Um, and the other thing that I'd like to say about this is that you know, people always talk about there being a tension between privacy and utility. And sometimes that's true and sometimes I would dispute it. But there's also perhaps a tension or there might be a uh, cont contention between um, utility and fairness. And so you have to make a decision. Are you going to say, and I mean sort of equitable fairness, not your kind of fairness, which we, I we, we, we dwell in unfairness. Right. OK. <laughs> and, and, and so you want to sort of say, well, do you want to maximize fairness subject to uh, getting optimal utility? Or do you want to say, here's the definition of fairness, and we want to maximize utility subject to ensuring fairness? And I think that's a, a very well-formulatable a uh, philosophical question that should be answered. So some have proposed that an ethicist be sort of interposed mm -hmm. between the firm and the use of algorithms. Right. Is, that, is that sort of in keeping with what you're describing, that somehow ethical considerations be blended in to the use of algorithms to make the kind of decisions Rainier is worried about, that is, personal decisions by, about individuals? I don't think that was what I was saying, but I'm all in favor of ethics. All right. Mitchell, you're up. Uh, I have the luxury of, of not being a regulator or an attorney. Um, uh, so I'm going to echo something Ari said earlier, which is um, I think we should, we should uh, strive to make the questions we're asking as abstract as we possibly can. We should not assume that the, the regulatory technology that we inherit is adequate for this new moment in the history of modernity. Uh, and to me, the, the large question is, uh, is the state the ultimate player in uh, the regulatory regime at this moment? I think we inherit from our past the presumption that the state is the ultimate sovereign. But it's not clear to me that that's a reasonable presumption to make going forward. Well, that's the perfect segue hmm. to my next question, which is, so we're now confronted with the internet of things. We have all these devices that are collecting enormous amounts of information about us, but there's no interface. There's no way to get notice. There's no way to exercise choice. My refrigerator of the future is going to know exactly how many beers I drink, how much chocolate ice cream I consume, <laughs> and all of those things. And you know what? They may be sharing that information pretty well. So the, 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 the conventional legal frameworks that exist in the EU, because we stole them in the United States, they're not going to map on well to the data collection aspects of future technology. So the last question that I have for each of you really is to what are the ways that we need to think in the future about how we are going to impose a regime? And, and, and to Mitchell's point, this doesn't necessarily have to be a regulatory regime. Ethics, you know, norms, business norms, all are going to play roles in the regulation of data collection and use going down the road. 
But, you know, John and Nicole are not just writing a report for today. <clears throat> They're writing a report for tomorrow. And I think that it's, it's incumbent upon us, and I know the regulators spend a lot of time thinking about this. I would imagine Erica spends a lot of time thinking about this. I know the EU is thinking about a lot about time. And Cynthia's already mapped this out mathematically. So my question to each of you is if you had one suggestion about how we start envisioning the regulatory framework of the future, where notice and consent in its traditional form is simply sort of impossible. Mm -hmm. What do we do? Do we just use restrictions, uh, codes of conduct, ethical constraints? Are there legal instruments? Are there normative instruments? How do you think about that? And what advice would you give to Nicole, who's got 16 and a half days now <laughs> to write her report? And Erica, you're, you're the closest, so you come close. <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with your premise that notice and consent doesn't work. Well, um, I'm talking about with my refrigerator. Well, my refrigerator so, just, there's no screen there. You know what? Though when I buy a refrigerator, if I think that it's going to be tracking every piece of food or <laughs> beverage that I remove from it, unless I'm on a strict diet and I want to impose that upon myself, um, I may not buy Well, you have a car, right? I do have a car. And your car is communicating all sorts of information. Are you going to sort of well, disable that? And I it's have not a just the refrigerator. It's, it's just not, though, but I have a choice about whether I want to have GPS in my car. It's not right? just GPS. Did not your, the next car you it's, buy is going to have all sorts of you know, tele uh, telemetry sending all sorts of information back to Detroit okay. or to Elon Musk or to whomever it is. <laughs> you probably got a cool car because you live in California. <laughs> all of that stuff is going to be going somewhere. And you're not, it, it's either going to be taking the bus, which no California ever does, or I'm going to walk. Car. I'm going to walk. <laughs> so you okay. got, you got so, to. All right, so I will assume for a moment. I, I, will take, I, right? I, I will take your, um, I will take your, I will presume that your assumption is accurate for a moment, right. but I don't take it as Godspell. Okay. Um, I do say if I'm walking down the street and there are sensors and lights, I don't have a choice about whether I want to walk down the street or not. And I think there you do get to codes of conduct. I think that you do need to be transparent about, that there, there needs to be something that, I don't want to say dictates how that information is used, because again, you want to have innovation. Um, but I think that I, it's it's a tough it's a tough tough question, um, but it goes to collection, um, personalization versus anonymization. And so, if it can be at the collection stage, de-anonymized. So if it right, um, you mean or de de, yeah, I'm sorry, de-identified. De explain to us why that's not possible. That's right. Well, and, and the <laughs> question is, can it get be collected? on an anonymous basis, as opposed to it's identifiable and then it's de-identifiable. And I understand that there are situations right. where you actually want to be able to identify, and maybe it's collected in a de-identified or an anonymized basis. Um, and if necessary, pursuant to lawful government request, and again, that's lawful government request per the US Constitution, um, maybe it can be identified information, so for, from a security perspective. Um, and then I think it also goes to collection and retention, and then use. Okay. Pam. Okay. Um, so I think, um, look, I, I think you know, we, can't, uh, we can't stop what's coming. The Internet of Things is coming. We can't say no uh, to, to the collection. Um, nor should we. Nor should we. Absolutely. Because there's a lot of benefit. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. Absolutely. I am a great believer right. in, in the benefits. Uh, uh, but I think you know, the, the, um, you, know, you need to address uh, the use. You know, one of the, the stains on American history is the internment of Japanese citizens during the war, um, during World War II. Uh, that came about in part because uh, the law was changed to allow the use of census data to identify those citizens. It's a great stain on the, the history of the census. But you know, the, the remedy is not to say we are not going to collect 
you know, data, data about ethnicity or about our population in the census. It is to do what we do today, to strictly restrict the use of that information, to say we're going to use it for statistical purposes only. Um, and you know, to build that into the ethics. I mean, there is now at the census a very strong sense of you know, that being a part of the culture of the institution. And I think that's you know, something that uh, you know, the ethics training for, uh, for data scientists and others can, can help to accomplish. I mean, you know, we've talked a lot about trust. Um, and I've been thinking about sort of the meaning of trust law in this concept. The notion, you know, we separate uh, uh, the legal ownership from the beneficial ownership. That somebody, you know, the, the collector of data has the, the, the data. Um, uh, they may have uh, legal title to it in some form. They have control. Um, but it needs to be for the benefit of, uh, you know, of the data subject. Um, and you know, that it, we need to look at ways that, that you know, their data subjects can enjoy the beneficial interest of the data uh, that, that they supply. Um, and I think that you know, companies that uh, are successful in this area, LinkedIn and others, uh, you know, have a sense of that ethic. Um, uh, you know, if you look at uh, Poneman Institute, has a, uh, you know, does a survey of the most trusted companies in America in relation to privacy. The top companies uh, uh, on that list are all companies that have a real sense of data stewardship. And I think that's what that sense of you know, being a trustee, uh, you know, of having some duties uh, to the people the data is about uh, it comes from. So I understand you. So you're really talking about a dual approach. One is a regulatory approach with use restrictions, and the other is a normative approach that companies just sort of yeah. should inculcate this idea that they're harvesting mm -hmm. this data for the benefit of their customers. Um, and I think we get there you know, through a variety of routes. I mean, the, I think the governance here is going to be like the Internet. It's a network of networks. We need, you know, sort of a... Uh, a take Julie's term, a tapestry of, of the ways of getting at the issue. Julie? So I think all of these um, solutions are important. You know, we d definitely need more ethics. We need to be thinking about algorithmics, consumer review data, consumer review boards, those sorts of things, best practices, codes of conduct. I am still a believer in data minimization because I, I deal with security breaches, data security breaches all the time, and I think data minimization and de-identification is still very important to try to minimize uh, the uh, negative effects of breaches. Notice and choice, I also believe, is still important. I think it needs, it's a concept that needs to be completely modernized for you know, the coming decade, uh, not only for the Internet of Things, where I think we need to have immersive apps that will give you notice of, so that you know that they're gonna, people will be collecting information about how much beer you drink and how much ice cream you eat and all the other bad things you're doing at night, David. Um, <laughs> and you don't only know half of And I only, yeah, I'm sure that's true. <laughs> um, but, but I, think, I think we can have you know, a, a much more sort of fluid way of dealing with notif notifying consumers and giving them choices in a, in a modern, really modern uh, way. But what I want to go to is um, the one piece of, piece of advice that I would give uh, to you all to think about is, look, you know, how do you develop the categories of harmful use, collection use, uh, and use of data? And you know, when you sit back and think about it, we as a society have already identified categories mm -hmm. of use right. that are harmful. We have health information that can be harm, you know, if it isn't appropriately controlled, can be harmful. Financial information, uh, so HIPAA, GLB. We've got FCRA, information that's used for critical decisions about consumers, credit, insurance, employment, housing, government benefits, all come under FCRA. We have kids and schools through COPPA and FERPA and those sorts of laws. All of those, I think, are society's way of identifying critical categories. The difficulty going forward, I think, is that those laws have, are applied in silos. They're applied with respect to, for HIPAA, covered entities. For COPPA, you know, with respect to just online services, maybe not other, uh, with FERPA, with respect to schools, uh, but only in certain circumstances. With respect to GLB, financial information, you've got to be a financial institution. Um, with respect to FCRA, you've got to be a credit reporting agency. My concern is that data doesn't understand silos. 
data is flowing very freely and being created and used in a very free way. And I think we need to think about the ways in which we can take these critical categories that we've already identified and maybe break down some of the silos and really so that these categories can be applied more broadly. That would be, I, I think it's a tough task, but I think it's in many ways the most critical task with respect to big data going forward. Rainier. Well, yeah, many, many elements, elements are already mentioned. Uh, I would add only uh, the, the elements we discussed in, in the European Union, privacy by design and default. Uh, we, we have an article for this in, in the uh, regulation. Uh, you could also think here about context uh, and use of these data that might be different uh, if it comes to a fridge or a car or whatever, uh, but um, the, the context and, and, and the protection of the context should should be one element, transparency in a way. Um, also, the problem, um, Julie mentioned, I think it's all, it's very much also about um, uh, unallowed access uh, about data security in these environments. Uh, that's extremely important, and this goes along also with the privacy issue, that these systems are uh, in a way protected. When it comes to control, um, I, I'm not really sure whether you can really control all these things. The fridge may be, I, I would wish a, a reset button for uh, if uh, my wife was on vacation or something like that and I bought uh, more beer and uh, meat or whatever, I'd like to delete these uh, kind of data. But um, this is only for my convenience maybe, the fridge. But other internet of things, the smart grid and cars and whatever, I mean if uh, the, the data are collected also in the interest of another uh, entity, uh, the, the company uh, providing uh, electricity or something else, uh, then um, I have only um, limited control uh, on this data because uh, it's also in the interest uh, of another. But maybe it's all about also a kind of a risk management. Uh, what might be very uh, helpful uh, is uh, not only um, impact assessment or risk analysis, but also kind of a risk management that has some uh, overlapping uh, uh, elements with privacy by design, privacy by default, but uh, if you create a system <clears throat> communicating things, uh, then those uh, who are offering uh, these things and, and, and develop the software, they should um, be aware of uh, risk analysis and also kind of a risk management. And the elements we mentioned maybe can be combined in different ways, but in the end, uh, a higher level of, of protection or control, whatever, has to be offered. Cindy. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I certainly believe that use restrictions will be relevant. And Cam talked about statistical use, and this is one place where I really can speak up and say, yeah, if you're going to use something statistically, you should use a tech, you, you, you need to articulate a big privacy principle. One example would be differential privacy, which says essentially that the outcome, the things you learn, the statistical conclusions that the company draws from the use of the Fitbit data and so on, would be essentially the same independent of the presence or absence of any individual or small set of individuals. This is the essence of what we mean by it's just statistical. Um, when it comes to recommending movies to me, you don't have to hide from me what movies I've seen in the past. It's okay to use all of the details about the movies I used in the past in order to make good recommendations to me. But the movies that Deirdre watched and David watched should maybe have not too much of an effect, a little bit of an effect, part of it maybe a big statistical effect on what gets recommended to me. But it, they shouldn't have a lot of impact. Um, and while we're at it, I, I really would suggest giving up on the fiction of de-identification as an end in itself. I, I mean, surely working with less information will leak less information, and, um, but it, I don't know that that's really the right thing to do. A lot of times, the things that you remove for the de-identification are things that you actually would be wanting to use. So find other ways, don't rely on de-identification. I would say to the White House team uh, to make this first and primarily 
a normative discussion, by which I mean uh, the, the landscape that we are entering is so complicated that um, uh, it's important to, to not get caught in Julie's tapestry, which frankly I'm quite worried about, because really? um, we do one. inherit an extraordinarily complex tapestry but I'd like to start with a national conversation about what the warp and woof of that tapestry should be, Touché. what its core components should entail. And on the basis of having a national or international conversation about those core components, we iterate new law going forward. Um, we uh, have about, oh, can I just want to, uh, sorry. to come back to a, a couple of points because I'm, uh, Julie talked about some of the areas that, that we regulate because we perceive risk and, and you know, uh, put, put limits around. Um, and uh, Reiner mentioned context. And, well, the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights looks at uh, precisely uh, you know, those uh, uh, things like uh, credit risk uh, uh, and others to define what is privacy risk uh, and just, you know, that, that privacy risk is a key element in looking at the context. Well, I mean, most sectoral laws are based mm -hmm. on a risk analysis. That's, Absolutely. Yeah. That is that's, sort it's of a the, fundamental yeah. risk analysis. That is analysis. the that's essence of the exactly American right. approach. But this gets at the, you know, the, the, the pieces that are not covered by, uh, by those laws. So we have about 17 minutes left. I know Deirdre is going to hold us to that. <laughs> so, so let's take some questions from the audience if there are any. If not, I've got tons more questions to ask this panel. Uh, yes. Is that Deb? Yeah. Oh. No, you can't see much. I really can't see much, but I saw the pink. So, so one of the, um, something that you said, Cam, on this panel in particular that I think has come up in themes and other panels is this notion that well, we, we don't want to stop collecting data, right? We just want to regulate how people use it, as though there's no normative harm from collecting data at all, as long as ultimately you're gonna use it for something, or even if you don't use it for something, right? And I think I would, I wonder what you think about putting collection to the same test you've recommended around use, in terms of what would a reasonable person reasonably expect from the context, right? Because I worry a little bit that this like, well, you know, co collection is always good. We don't want to not have refrigerators that tell us when we're out of milk. But at the same time, it sort of feels like sometimes, oh, well, then we won't talk about collection at all. And that doesn't seem like the right yeah. approach either. So I'm curious. Well, I, I think it's a fair point. And I, uh, I'm not saying that we should not talk about collection at all. I think there, there clearly are, are circumstances where one would say we are, that, that's data uh, we are not going to collect. Or that, that you know, this particular uh, category of uh, person should not collect. And the example uh, that I talked about yesterday was uh, and, uh, you know, an app uh, that you know, has a, a very specific purpose uh, but collects data that has nothing to do with the purposes of, of, of that app. That's, you know, that's, that's collection and I think it's arguably Unfair. Well, we've brought uh, a case. We did a case with a flat. I think it was talked about earlier or yesterday. The flashlight app that downloaded mm -hmm. con a contact, you know, contact lists for uh, the users. I mean, just completely mm -hmm. out of context, completely um, uh, not um, expected by the consumers. And we um, determined, I believe, that that was uh, uh, unfair. We may have used a deception count. A deception yeah, we may have used a deception count there. But arguably, we. Could have used an unfairness count as well. I just want, I'm glad you raised that, Devin, because I, I, I want to resist quite strongly this notion that collection is an inevitable fact of the future. I mean, should my refrigerator be able to collect data on what I eat? I mean, what are the, what are the uh, conditions or criteria that we ought to apply to the, the privilege of data collection? I mean, I think if we, if we set us, if, if we just t turn data collection into a fact, we give away a big part of the store of what we're capable of regulating. Well, and then, yeah. and then it leads to the problem of breaches, which is what I mentioned before. And that's why, I, you know, that's a part of the FIPS 
that folks don't like to talk about when they're talking about big data, but I think it's an important concept well, that we and need what, to retain. I mean, the, the, I mean there's an, another very strong uh, legal tradition tells me that collection is a form of discipline in itself. So, you know, so an entity, uh, public or private, collecting information is itself an act of control. So we yeah. can't just say that that's exempt and inevitable from our scrutiny. That is a potential harm that we need to take into account. But we cannot disregard the, the enormous benefits of new knowledge uh, uh, that the data, uh, big data enables, whether it's in medical research or smart cities or a number of the other sorts of applications. Uh, that, that we have heard about. Does that mean you know, we need to have uh, smart refrigerators? Not necessarily, but some people may want to make that choice. That, then, you know, that may be a convenience to them. But you know, we, you know, we, we should not, I think, be uh, sort of dystopians uh, about uh, uh, the potential here. Uh, at the same time, we need to recognize that there are risks that, that need, to be, uh, need to be controlled. You know, or uh, at least in the hands of, of uh, other governments that, that um, you know, look at that are far more repressive, uh, um, you know, they, that, that there there will be dystopias. So okay, wait, we need, we need, this we need, for Julie's t a balancing test about not being speculative right. on mm -hmm. the right. benefits as well right. as the harms mm -hmm. should right. come in. Right. Should there be some arguments, serious arguments yeah, first that question. something is useful? Okay. Well, I think we need, and we need to look at it in a specific Sorry, case. We need to do it in a specific context. It's hard to sort of generally say, and you know, we, we dwell with in cases, you know, and, and that's where that balancing test would take place. Okay, this gentleman had his hand up first. Danny also has a question. A bunch of questions. Danny has one. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carey made the comment earlier that, uh, and I think you said something like, an 80%, you know, an algorithm that is correct in 80% of the cases for a credit decision is not going to be good enough. I think a, a better question is whether and how we can improve the algorithm. Because first, I think you know the, comp the lender is definitely interested in having a more accurate algorithm. They're not interested mm -hmm. in lending money to deadbeats in 20% of the cases. Um, second, you know, if, if I don't know if 80% is good enough or not. What I know is, is, you know, so if we can't improve the algorithm, how did we do it before algorithms? And generally it was, well, you got, your, your local bank would lend you money if you were a poker partner with the bank president at the local Rotary Club. Yeah. That's not, that's, 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 that's not a great, so, you know, I, I don't know whether 80% is how accurate those algorithms are. Maybe it's more, maybe it's less, I don't know. But the question is how we can improve the algorithm. Cynthia, why don't yeah. you answer that question? <laughs> Actually, I think an interesting question is um, how much more accurate is that than just sort of saying yes all the time? I mean, if you used an algorithm that's 80% accurate, would you get better returns as a bank than if you just say yes always? I mean, you have to figure out what you're comparing to. Danny. Uh, you can wait one second okay. while the mic swiftly makes its rounds to you. Thank you. So I, I just wanted to ask the panel's view of what it is that you're all actually talking about in this collection versus use discussion and whether it is a collection versus use discussion. Some people are kind of defending the importance of collection limitation. Other people saying, well, we need to focus on usage limitation. I, I, I wonder if anyone on the panel thinks this is a kind of a strict either or. And I guess I also wonder whether those who, whether when, when you look at the collection limitation question, do you think we actually understand enough about that uh, how would we actually explore that question? My own view is that uh, um, the reason we talk about usage limitation is not because we think collection limitation is dumb, uh, but because we think it doesn't do the job, and we're stuck on the usage side, kind of for better or for worse. And I just wonder if, if so, so people me, agree with that. Let me intersect just for, intervene just for a second. The premise of the question was in you know when you're starting to use internet wire devices like cars, refrigerators, smart grids, and so forth, there is no interface for the traditional notice and choice 
So I was asking the panel essentially to zoom away the collection issue. This is where Erica pushed back and said, I'm not going to do it. And, I, and I, so I don't think that you, you should assume that anyone on the panel was suggesting right. that collection restrictions should just sort of disappear. No, now, 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 let me ask your question yeah. this way, which is, Manny has posed the question about what do we do about collection limitations, right? And where does the panel stand and what do they think that means? Is that a fair way to summarize well, your question? I also want to know, do we, are we pointing to use because we think we know what those are, or is it just... When you say those are, the uses... Well, do we know what usage limitations we would want? Uh, do, if, if we say, well, it's difficult to do... Well, we're imagining, I mean, we're imagining yeah. part of this, but to the extent you can answer, if this were a deposition, I would not allow anyone to answer that question. <laughs> but, but since, since we're, we're among friends, to the extent you can answer it, Erica. Let's start you, with Mitch. Well, we'll start time. with Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've answered first. Uh. <laughs> I need the question again. I really, I really do need the question. I don't, I don't well, I think, see I think, it. I think Danny has two concerns. One is, what role should com uh, collection restrictions play? And two is, can you impose use restrictions in the abstract, or do you, know ex do you need to know exactly what it is you're prohibiting and why? Well, it's, it, it seems to me in both instances, having a first principles conversation is better, right? Because if, if for example, we have, uh, if, 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 say, one of our first principles is the preservation of an open future for data, uh, for data suppliers, as an educator, I think about that a lot. If, if I have as a first principle, I, predictive analytics are very valuable, but I don't, want to, I don't want to build an inevitable future for a particular, for a particular student. It seems to me on the basis of that kind of principle, I could make decisions about particular collection and usage strategies. Um, but until we have the, the, those kinds of um, uh, constitutional places to start, I just think we, we have endless conversations about details that will be hard to, to accumulate into intellectual progress. Cynthia, you're up. So I would think really, really long and hard before collecting. And um, I don't know. I, this is so much not my field. I don't know how you say how, how, how these sorts of decisions get made and controlled. But certainly when we were on the, um, the panel that produced the report on privacy and the struggle against terrorism, there was a big discussion about first having to argue that getting this information and using it is actually going to be useful. It's going to serve a purpose. And so I think that we need to have some kind of threshold along those lines for, this, for, for more general things. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I would think a lot about collection, and I would think a lot about use. Oh yeah. If, uh, well, if, if it's about the public sector, clearly you have to regulate the collection first and then the use. I mean, this is the, uh, the, yes. the law like we draw it in the public sector. In the private sector, um, I would say it's not a it's not a choice between regulating collection or use. Uh, it's about both. And sometimes I wonder really if we still can talk about collection if data is already available. I mean, if the data is there somewhere, <laughs> accessible, uh, and uh, little NSAs or big NSAs can uh, uh, use these data because they have access to, to, to these data, um, then uh, you cannot only focus on uh, regulating the collection of data. And I also think, I mean, in the, in the private sector, um, the business models, they, they will develop and, and they will use these new technologies. And uh, you can uh, maybe draw some red lines so you can say, okay, we implement some principles like privacy by default and data minimization and so on. But the data, they will grow anyway because the technology is spreading in, in all areas of our lives. And um, so um, I think... Maybe we should think also about other criteria, whether it makes a difference if data is already available and then you have to regulate use and identification and so on uh, or not. But I think we need more categories uh, instead of only collection and use. 
Julie. Uh, that makes sense to me. I mean, I, um, I just don't think it's an either or proposition. I mean, Danny and I have talked about this many times. I know that, you know, there are concerns about how much we can control collection. Um, in light of you know where data is flowing and, and where technology is right now. But I think that there have to be some limits on it. I mean, again, the flashlight case is a good example. It was just so out of context. And I think that most people would agree, perhaps not everybody, but most people would agree that that was an appropriate case for the FTC to bring. Um, so you know, I, it, this to me is not either or. What I try to um, constantly remind folks of when we're in this conversation about big data is that it is not just about use because I think there's a tendency on the part of industry and those and and big data proponents which I frankly think of myself as being one I mean I am I'm very optimistic about some of the benefits of big data but I think there's a tendency to say well we'll, we'll just focus on use and then everything else will be okay because after all if we start limiting collection we don't know what benefits will come out and we, we just we need to allow free flowing collection and I just I, I maybe we'll be there someday I hope not but um, I, I, I see so many harms from so much data being collected. If you look at the financial system, you know the Visa MasterCard system sets up rules around how much, how long information can be held. I mean, and there are reasons for that. The reasons are um, because of breaches, and and I think we we just have to keep that in mind as we go forward. So I, I, it's for me, it's definitely not an either or proposition. Yeah, I I agree that it's not an either or proposition. I'm. Uh, you know, I spoke at the outset uh, about uh, the, the privacy principles applying holistically. Uh, one of those is control. That is basically you know, a principle that applies at the point of collection. Uh, another is focused collection. As you know, Danny, that incorporates uh, uh, the, the FIPS principles of, of uh, data minimization um, uh, and, uh, as well as uh, use uh, limitations. Um, uh, those are sort of after the fact, but I think focused collection also involves making uh, considered, intelligent, responsible decisions about uh, what to collect in the first place. And I think the, uh, the brightest flashlight case is an example of collection that was not focused. Yeah, I also don't believe that it's an either or, and I think and I think it was you, Julie, who talked about the first person relationships, and therefore you can't have consent in those situations, and I think that's really important. Um, I also think that you can collect data where it's not personalized, and we should be thinking about that. And so um, I also think that use of, you know, we're not calling them ethicists today in companies, but in many ways they are, and, and it's that trust, and if I, tried to go to a first principle that could be a guiding principle for all companies, regardless of whether there's um, first person relationships or not, it's what's the reasonable expectation? So what's the reasonable expectation of a consumer buying the refrigerator, buying the car, or walking down the street? Let me just add one thing. I mean, one of the most you know, sort of important privacy cases the FTC has done in the last five years was a case against Sears. And that was all about yep. unexpected, un inappropriate data collection. And I think that- Tracking. Yeah, so the, the line I think the FTC has drawn roughly is the right one to draw about collection. And I think it's been articulated across the board here. There are some collections that are unexpected and just inappropriate. And we need to continue to hold the line there. But I think going forward, we're gonna need to spend a lot of time, maybe more time than we have in the yeah. past, trying to figure out precise use restrictions because some data collection is, unconsented to data collection is gonna be inevitable. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten a ruling from Deirdre. I can, I can ask one more question. There's a young woman in the back who's had her hand up from the beginning. I'm Elizabeth Waska and I cover big data at the Wall Street Journal. Um, and uh, I just had a question, I know it's about consumer credits, about the alternative scoring industries, and we talked about it a little, and you're talking about it at the FTC. Um, you know, right now, consumers can be, can get scores, you know, on their propensity to be gambler, you know, can be scored on all sorts of things, their propensity to be gamblers, their propensity for certain health risks, whether they're gonna go broke. Do you think that consumers should have the right to know what their scores are, who gives their scores, and what's the law that would enable that right now? So just so everyone knows, the FTC's been on record for four years now 
that the answer to those questions is yes. Um, <laughs> well, and let, let, let Julie start out, and then we'll get get responses from others. You know, there there's scores and there's scores, right? And so we did just Liz, as you know, we just had a workshop on this issue, and um, you know. The, let me give you the example that I think is the most salient and poignant and the one that I'm most worried about. So in the credit reporting realm, we have a system that says if you're going to be given a pre-approved offer of credit, if, there's, if a pre-approved offer of credit is going to be developed, those are the envelopes. Remember when we used to deal in tree bark and people used to get uh, paper <laughs> envelopes? Um, you know, you'd get an envelope that said you'd been pre-approved for this offer of credit. You'd open it up, and you, if you filled it out and sent it back in, there, were ve there was very um, strict rules around the extent to which you could then be denied. Generally speaking, you had to be then granted that um, credit offer, or you had to be granted the credit because the way that uh, offer was generated was through your credit report, more or less. Um, I'm, I'm doing this kind of quickly. So that is an interesting business model, something that's been around for a long time. We've had strict rules around it. What happens if instead um, a bank decides to go to an alternative scoring company and says, tell me the consumers that I'm going to want to do business with to offer good loans and to send emails that advertise my good loans and you know at a good rate. Or maybe not a good rate, maybe a subprime rate. rate. Um, and so emails are sent out based on, a, based on a scoring model. What's the line between a pre-approved offer of credit and an ad where you're given an, uh, you know, I, I think, and, and the ad is based upon an algorithm that has scored you and maybe you've been given a worse rate based on that score. This is something I'm deeply concerned about, and it's one of the reasons why I've been proposing allowing more transparency into this scoring process. I call it reclaim your name. I think consumers need to get more information about this. We can call it whatever we want to call it. We could call it blue cheese, but I think we really need to give uh, more transparency around some of these when it's being used for substantive important, important purposes. And if you look at the 2012 privacy report that the FTC put out, there's actually a couple of paragraphs e explaining yep. in some more depth exactly that time. So our time is up. Before I thank the panel, I want to spend a minute just thanking Deirdre Mulligan. Yes. For yes. Putting together. <laughs> Join me in thanking the panel for sitting in front of the crowd.